Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In 1944, a B-25 Mitchell flown by Ira Barnett took off from an airfield in Papua New Guinea on a regular mission to harry any Japanese shipping that they came across. Attacking a barge, the Japanese managed to get some lucky shots in on Ira's plane. Attempting to nurse the Mitchell back to base, it became obvious to the crew that they weren't going to make it and would be forced to make an emergency landing in a swamp. In this episode, we're looking at the ordeal the crew went through and the rescue mission that was launched in an attempt to bring the boys back home. I'm joined by Bas Kruger. Bas is an aviation historian and author of Case, which recounts the story and Bass's own attempts to locate the B-25 over 70 years later. But before we get to that, it's a big thank you to all those who already support the podcast and have become patrons. A dollar or so from people like you, loyal listener, help me find the time to put the show together. Now you can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. I really do value your support. And when possible, I do try to make available extra bits and bobs exclusive for patrons. A bit more World War II chat, as it were. So that's patreon.com slash ww2podcast. So we're in New Guinea, uh, Baz, uh, with the uh, Air Force, US Air Force, in the summer of 1944. Shall we set the scene? How uh, is the war in the Pacific at this time for Ira and the uh, other air crews? (laughs) Yeah, that's it. That, that's really different from uh, from Europe, of course. Not bombing from great height, no strategic targets, no cities to bomb, no factories or whatsoever. So it's uh, more or less a tactical uh, air war, uh, bombing Japanese positions, ships, uh, airfields, things like that. And of course, trying to strangle them, their logistics, uh, so hit shipping and, and all kinds of stuff like that. And the other thing is um, having um, air superiority, of course, because MacArthur can only uh, advance if he has uh, an air umbrella over his troops. And because there's a lot of invasions, I mean, in in 1944, they did, I think, some 10 to 15 amphibious invasions, and they were building bases after that. So they were also gathering a lot of intelligence, so photo reconnaissance, uh, sending in uh, teams on the ground to take soil samples to see if you can build an air base or a port somewhere. Uh, because all the information on, on the country, on New Guinea, both uh, Papua New Guinea and Dutch New Guinea, was very sketchy. Uh, it was hardly explored before the war, and they never thought they would fight a war there, neither the Japanese nor the Allies. So that's, that's I think, the scene for, for the air war, uh, uh, Tactical bombing, um, uh, air-to-air combat, a little bit. In '44, the Japanese were were uh, beaten in that in that field, and uh, intelligence, photo ops, um, and air sea rescue. A lot of air sea rescue uh, missions. Yeah, well, it's, it's a big theatre. So we're following the 418th, it's the Night Fighter Squadron, isn't it? So. They're in, they're in they're New Guinea. Do they come straight to the Pacific? What's the New Guinea like for these flyers? Yeah, they, they, they were trained in uh, Florida. Um, there were a bunch of uh, night fighter squadrons uh, trained there. And they were sent out in uh, late 1943, first to Port Moresby and the, the eastern part of Papua New Guinea. And their main task there was to uh, to fight the washing machine Charlie, the, the, the Japanese night intruders, just um, yeah, being uh, uh, bothersome over the airfields, dropping uh, a bomb here and a bomb there. Uh, so they were patrolling against them. But you have to imagine there's no uh, navigational aids there. There's there, there are no lighthouses, no cities, no recognizable structures on the ground. So night flying and in the in the tropical weather it, during the night, that must have been scary, scary stuff to do. And that's the, where they 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 started at the uh, at the end of 1943, and then moving up with the uh, with the American advance. First to I think Ley, and then to uh, to Hollandia, and finally they head up to um, to the Philippines. I'm, I'm right in saying they're meant to get Black Widows, but they get the B-25 Mitchell. So 
So the, 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 the what did the crews think? They're offered a Ferrari and they get a sort of a Model T Ford. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They were flying the the P seventy, the uh, the night fighter variant of the uh, A twenty light attack bomber, and they were promised the uh, the P sixty ones. And they had even arrived in Australia, and they sent down a team to uh, I think to Brisbane to assemble them and to bring them over to uh, to New Guinea. But in the meantime, um, Fifth Air Force decided that they had yeah, to switch over to some old leftover B-25s. Uh, it's the B-25H model, uh, the one with a 75 millimeter cannon uh, in it, but that has been taken out. So yeah, they get the hand-me-downs of the other squadrons. And uh, But what I read from their squadron logbook is that when they really started operating, operating them, well, they, they liked it. It was offensive warfare. They were flying during uh, daylight hours and not just like night fighters sitting there waiting till some Japanese show up. Uh, so they, they really liked uh, the hunting for uh, Japanese shipping and attacking airfields and uh, small harbors and things like that. It, it was dangerous, not, not very dangerous, but was dangerous. But yeah, what kind of flying in New Guinea was not dangerous. So they they, they liked it. You, you kind of think that uh, you know that it is sort of playing settle, second fiddle to Europe, isn't it? When they get the they don't get the best planes. They they're not in great barracks. They're living in makeshift uh, ad hoc camps, having to put up with uh, fighting hot, damp, malaria. It's a very rough existence for these crews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, all over the army, not just uh, the Air Force guys, but also in the army. Uh, more of them were uh, taken to hospital for, for illness, for malaria and for scrub typhus and things like that. Then they were uh, wounded by, uh, <laughs> by enemy fire or something like that. There were also a lot of suicides there in, uh, in New Guinea. A lot of, lot of uh, soldiers killed themselves. They, they couldn't stand the... The humidity, the heat, the boredom, uh, the the filth, uh, things like that. That's also what 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 struck me when reading reading up on this uh, this story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so we're looking at Ira uh, Barnett. Uh, Barnett and his crew. Uh, so the twenty seventh of July forty four, uh, they take off in their. Uh, what was their mission that day? But they had a, an armed reconnaissance mission uh, flying over the uh, the Birdhead Peninsula of uh, Dutch New Guinea uh, and trying to intercept any Japanese shipping, uh, trying to bring in supplies for the uh, for the garrisons in uh, still uh, active in in New Guinea. MacArthur had bypassed uh, a number of uh, big Japanese garrisons, and if you cut off their supplies, their food, their their uh, fuel, their ammunitions. Well, they can't do much harm. I think I called it in the book virtual island hopping because he was not really island hopping, but he was in in, in Wewak in Papua New Guinea. He left a huge Japanese garrison of 40,000 men. Uh, they were sitting there up till the end of the war, being dangerous in that spot, but not being able to leave there. So they were were flying around the coast of, of the Birdshead Peninsula looking for uh, Japanese shipping, and, and they found one of those barges. A barge doesn't sound pretty much of a threat. So, uh, um, you know, how do, they, how do they go about attacking a barge? Because I don't suppose the Mitchell's raison d'etre is necessarily attacking shipping. It's a, it's a bomber, isn't it? Yeah, but the, um, uh, the Fifth Air Force had, I think, starting somewhere in 1943, uh, started modifying uh, all these uh, twin-engine bombers, so the A-20, uh, the Boston, and the uh, or the Havoc in in U.S. parlance, and the uh, and the Mitchell to strafers, so arming them up with a lot of uh, heavy machine guns in the nose, or on the side of the fuselage, 12.50 machine guns, uh, so you could strafe uh, Japanese positions, and if you attacked uh, Japanese shipping. Yeah, either those 12 machine guns destroyed the whole whole wooden ship or if they were attacking a Japanese destroyer, the personnel manning the, the guns, they were really, it was better to, to take cover <laughs> when the Mitchells attacked. So in this case, um, they found that barge and there were four uh, B-25s in the, um, in the in the group, in the, in the mission. Barnett saw the barge uh, first, but he was pushed out of the attack pattern 
uh, and he was last to come in. And he made uh, a crucial mistake. He was too low over the water, and therefore he couldn't really dive on the on the ship. But he was flying level, so he couldn't really fire into the ship. He was, I think, more or less flying over it. So that gave the Japanese uh, gunners chance to fire back, uh, and they hit him. They hit him in his uh, in his left engine. Uh, he dropped one of his uh, his bombs. He had six 100-pound uh, bombs, so not very heavy ones, and that hit the ship uh, midship, destroyed it. But he was hit in in the engine and in the uh, rudder cables, and he soon found out he wasn't uh, able to to get back to his base in uh, Vakte. Uh, and there was uh, only one possibility: he tried to reach uh, the big island of Biak, uh, where there was a, a U.S. base. Uh, but that was flying some 350 kilometers uh, over land to reach it on one engine, uh, shot up rudder cables, a leaking fuel tank. So he tried, but uh, after I think 10 minutes of flying, he realized he, he couldn't make it. Had he realized that earlier, he could have ditched his plane and waited for a Catalina for the, from the Air Sea Rescue to pick him up. Um, but he was over land. So he had only one one option was or two options either jump by parachute or try to crash land uh, his plane. Well, jumping by parachute is uh, certainly in New Guinea not the best option uh, because the four crew members would lose sight of each other. They would would end up individually with only their personal um, survival equipment. Yeah, and I think that they wouldn't have survived that. So he decided on a, on a crash landing, uh, saw uh, some open area, thought it was grassland. And when he came in to land, it turned out to be a swamp, a huge uh, Sago swamp. I make the comparison to uh, to a big American city uh, or in Holland, one of the, our provinces that, that big. Yeah, I, I think maybe, well, name one of the, the big U, uh, UK cities that, that kind of size the swamp is. Uh, and he landed in it and, and, and did that successfully. Um, at the last uh, moment when, when gliding, he hit a tree and the, uh, the plane broke in two and it threw two of his crew members out in the, in the swamp. But all four uh, survived and then they were stuck 60 kilometers from shore and 300 kilometers from the nearest Allied base. I have visions of uh, Star Wars, you know, when Luke Skywalker sat there with his plane in the swamp. Um, do they have a, a standard sort of operating procedure? I mean, are they are they trained for you know your, your planes come? You've had you've been forced to crash land in the in the jungle, right? This is what you do. Does training kick in or? Yeah, that, that's that's a good question. I, I I don't exactly know. I know they got a jungle survival uh, training, but I've no idea how serious these guys took it. I mean, they were all young lads and they were thinking well i'm invincible i'll return or whatever and there was just an australian army unit starting to give uh allied pilots a jungle survival training uh, it was a uh, i think some 15 man strong detachment from the australian army that was in hollandia the jungle training detachment um so i think they they did have some 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 training on that uh, but in this case, uh, they were very, very fortunate because their air gunner was a, a very colorful uh, figure, a Native American uh, chief of the Mohegan tribe. And the Mohegan is uh, the tribe that's uh, written about in Last of the Mohicans, that book. Um, so he was the son of the chief, so chief in being, uh, <laughs> uh, other words. And he had a lot of bushcraft. So... He knew exactly what to do when they were stranded in that swamp. And at first, uh, the pilot and the navigator were started fighting. Uh, well, shitty pilot to land me here. And the pilot said, well, you shitty navigator to, to let us land in this swamp. And then Tantaquidgeon, Harold Tantaquidgeon, the Native American, stepped in and he took over. And uh, Ira Barnett handed over command to him uh, and said, well, it's now your show from this from this moment on. And I think they were very fortunate in that. No, no panic there, and uh, Harold organized uh, everything, so they um, they could survive in the in the swamp. But yeah, the rescue that was, of course, another story. <laughs> well, so to the to the um, to the uh, to, to his uh, the rest of his the people he was flying with. Do they, they know where he's come down? Do they know? 
that he was in trouble or are they just in the middle of nowhere no one has a clue yeah they were flying with four and one of the other planes was also shot up and of course most of these formations have plane and wingmen to so two plane formations so the other two went off to uh, to Biak and they um, uh, that plane just made the uh, the airstrip crash landed on the airstrip and Barnett was fortunate in that his wingman uh, had lost him during the attack but couldn't hear anything the radio was damaged as well so he started looking for him and he uh, in in I think a couple of hours he he found him or not cannot be a couple of hours but in within an hour or so he uh, he found him he knew of course that from the uh, the position where they attacked the Japanese ship flying a straight line to Biak, he had to be somewhere in between. And he found them and he wiggled his wings yeah, to show them that he, he'd seen them. And then he flew back to uh, to Biak to report uh, that one of the planes was down and he'd seen a number of the crew uh, walking around uh, the plane. So Catalina's dispatched. I mean, can a Catalina do anything? <laughs> I don't suppose a Catalina can land in a swamp, can it? Yeah. No, no, there was no Catalina dispatched at that moment because they were in a swamp 60 kilometers from the nearest uh, open water, uh, McClure Gulf. And the nearest biggest river, the Kais River, I think was something like 20 or 30 kilometers. Well, and if you know that you're walking about 500 meters per hour through that swamp, well, you can imagine that going that 20 kilometers... And they, they they shouldn't leave the plane. I mean, that there were all supplies there, weapons recognizable from the air. If they went walking, I think they had disappeared in, in the jungle or in the swamp. So they stayed there. But uh, I think the same day or a day later, um, uh, their squadron uh, and the 5th Air Force sent out another uh, B-25 uh, looking for them. They found them and they took pictures of the, of the surrounding area. And they dropped a little note uh, that they found uh, the guys so they they knew they were sighted and they were told that help was on its way but what kind of help and and how they didn't really know what amused me is that because they, they don't have a radio is they the convoluted way that they have to stand on their wings in certain so one man stand on the wing this wing another man stand on that wing and that means this and you do this and and that's how they communicate with them because it's a long time before they ever get around to dropping a walkie-talkie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they had something like um, if you lay out, lay flat on the wing and have your arms and legs spread, then there's something uh, uh, happening. And if two of, the, uh, two of the crew do that, then there are uh, uh, natives or Japanese in the neighborhood. They had indeed such kind of sign uh, language. It's very clever. So do... do... Do do the Allies have? I mean, the Allies, the Americans. Do they, do they have teams that extract downed airmen from inland areas? No, they they uh, up till this moment they really didn't have that. They had a, an air sea rescue squadron, uh, flying Catalinas, uh, the second air sea rescue squadron, or um, uh, sorry, emergency rescue squadron, and they were had just arrived uh, uh, over there, but they couldn't land in in the swamp, of course. And they were uh, instrumental in picking up all kind of aircrew from the ocean. Uh, so no problem there. And most of the aircrew that uh, that had something, they ditched and then were either picked up or captured by the Japanese. I don't think very many uh, crew um, landed inland and then uh, were known to have survived. Um, most were planes exploded or were shot down, crashed, really crashed. Uh, so this was a, a fairly unique uh, situation, and unfortunately, I haven't been able to to find the um, the archives uh, of the Fifth Air Force discussing this problem. Uh, but I know how they ended up. They they uh, uh, made up a team of U.S. Um, uh, emergency rescue personnel from the their headquarters, and they sent message to um, to Hollandia, where that that Australian jungle training detachment was stationed. And to bring a number of these guys up to uh, to Biak. And because I think, again, uh, it was in Dutch New Guinea and the locals were used to talking uh, either Dutch or Dutch Malay, they asked for a certain Dutch uh, lieutenant, uh, Louis Rapmund, who'd worked with the Americans before, 
to join them and uh, yeah to to be a interpreter uh, and guide for the for the team so they made up a team of 10 12 people Rapman took a, a number of indonesian uh, dutch east indies army soldiers with him uh, four australians captain gillespie and three ncos and uh, two uh, staff sergeants from the from the americans but as there were uh, a fair number of japanese in the area they didn't feel really secure so they asked volunteers from the 41st infantry division american division that had just uh, fought uh, a pitched battle with the japanese on biak and incredibly i think some 300 soldiers volunteered for this crazy mission and and so they they took uh, a number of these guys uh, and staff sergeant uh, victor krause was their their commander uh, and they they brought with them uh, heavy weapons, machine guns, uh, rifles, hand grenades, stuff like that. And they were trained infantry uh, men, so they had those as more or less combat troops uh, with them. So a team of uh, let's say 18 strong were then a couple of days later, early August, uh, flown in by a Catalina to the uh, to the shore of McClure Gulf and landed near a small village, uh, Kampong Muhadin, and from there. They started organizing the uh, the rescue uh, trip. Do they have any idea how you know uh, of the Japanese troops in the area? Do they do they know what to expect? Do they have any intelligence? I mean, do the Japanese actively go seeking downed airmen? No, um, I I don't think they they actively uh, unless they landed more or less uh, beside their air base something like that. But in this case, um, I don't even think the Japanese knew a plane had crashed. But uh, ironically enough, uh, there were a lot of Japanese on, on the coastline because they were survivors from all those ships that were sunk. Every day they sunk tens of those barges in those waters. And mostly, of course, the, the Japanese troops uh, uh, died in those attacks. But yeah, sometimes they could reach shore and then you had 10, 15, 50, 100 uh, angry and well not very well armed but yeah uh, uh, capable um, combat personnel in in the area and if they had some connections with the local papuans then they um, they they heard about allied troops in in the forest so rapment and the team they they knew it was just a matter of time be before the japanese would hear of them and well start acting uh, upon that doing something so how cl how close can they get uh, to they get the team in onto the crash site? That's one of the, the the problems I'm still struggling with. We know generally where the crash site is. Uh, there were a lot of photos taken uh, during that first reconnaissance end July, early August, but only one of those photos survived, or at least I only I found only one. But from the reports, I read that there must have been scores of photos taken. And they, they even draw maps from these photos because they needed a reference, I think, on the river to find the plane because you sail down the river. And at a certain point, you say, hey, in this bend of the river, we go on shore and then we travel in that direction in the swamp and then we find uh, the plane. And the only picture I have is too much zoomed in, so to speak. I, I, I can see the plane and its surroundings, but no reference on a river or whatsoever. So... I think uh, it will be some three, maybe two, three kilometers from the nearest small river, the Sigi River, and they can uh, canoe up some 10, 15 kilometers on the on the Kais River uh, upstream, yeah, and then have to to go into the swamp. But because there are so many uh, Japanese troops uh, reported in the area, uh, Louis Rapmund, who as far as I can see, is commanding the team, although the Australian army captain has a higher rank. Uh, it is a U.S. plane and there's a U.S. sergeant of the survival team. But I think Louis uh, commanded uh, uh, the, the team. He decides to split up and he stays in Kampung Baru, somewhere halfway on the, on the Kais River, to organize uh, a defense. Because if they all go up and the Japanese come, they'll be cut off. And they can't retreat to uh, uh, to the ocean. Uh, and he stays there with uh, the American combat uh, troops, with Krause and his men, and um, uh, Mac Gillespie and his uh, Australian uh, sergeants 
uh, plus an Indonesian interpreter and uh, a guide, and of course a number of Papuans. They uh, go further upstream in 10 canoes, three big ones and 10 small ones, and they paddle up the, the Kais and then the Sigi River to try and find the uh, the crew. So while they're, while they're looking for the crew, Rapman gets word that there's possibly 100 Japanese heading in his way, so they're vastly out, outnumbered. Um, you know, it must have been within his uh, purview to think about uh, calling a plane to come and take him out. Uh, but they they decide to st- st- make a stand of it. How, you know, how do they manage to um, overcome uh, a determined hundred Japanese troops? Well, I, it, I don't know if they were determined because I don't know if they really knew that the uh, the, the the Americans, the Allies, were there. Um, because Rockmund had already uh, contacted the local Papuans, and they were. It's difficult to to really find out if that it was so, but they were on the hand of the Allies. From the most things I read, is that the, the Papuas didn't really it in, didn't interest them. Whoever was winning the war, as long as they were treated well, and the Japanese were treating them worse than the Allies, so they were in favor of the Allies. But he could speak their language, and uh, he sent down some um, some Papuans uh, in canoes down the river to see if there were any Japanese coming up, and if so, warn uh, him of it. And then he heard about the hundred Japanese coming up in something like uh, ten canoes or so, and he again sent down that uh, that Papua guy to tell the rowers in the canoes who were also Papuas to make those 10 canoes spread out over the river. So not coming all in one bunch to the village, but one after another. uh, So that he could overwhelm them individually instead of having a hundred Japs at one time. And that worked. So he, together with Krause, he made an ambush with a 30 millimeter uh, machine gun and some riflemen. And when the, uh, the, the first Japanese canoe arrived, he uh, let a Papua call uh, to the rowers to row further to the um, uh, to the village. At that time, they could uh, order the, the Japanese to surrender. Well, some of them did, some of them didn't, and then uh, the, the shooting started, and they uh, they they killed most of the the Japanese and took a one or two of them uh, prisoner. And that that happened with every canoe. That, uh, that arrived uh, at the village, so they could overwhelm them one by one, uh, until one of the uh, the canoes didn't respond. Uh, the people were still sitting in it. And then Rapmund shouted in uh, Malay, uh, oh, jump overboard to the rowers. The Japanese couldn't understand it. So they were still sitting in the canoe and all the Papuans were swimming away. And then the machine gun opened fire and killed all the Japanese in the, uh, in the canoe. Um, so that way he he defeated those uh, those hundred men. Uh, there was no one wounded on the on the Allied side, uh, and he, and he captured a number number of them. It's a remarkable feat managing to get them to all come in one at a time, so you can destroy them in detail. <laughs> now the the rescue team. I mean, you, you talked before about how it's yeah, you know uh, how slow it is to get through the uh, walk through the jungle. You know, when they get somewhere close to the crash site, how difficult is it to locate the crash site? Incredibly difficult. They they try an, a, a numerous times to get into the swamp and to uh, yeah, try locate the uh, the wreck of the plane and, and, and the crew and have to turn back uh, three times and almost are on the verge of giving up. Uh, uh, Mac Gillespie even sends back a, a messenger to uh, Baru saying, well, we, we can't make it and uh, we probably will turn back. And then they, they try a final time. And because of one of the local people tells them that every day an Allied plane is coming over and is circling in a certain area. So they think, hey, that must be our, uh, our own planes dropping supplies to the crew. So it must be in that area. Um, and they set out in that area and... Well, the, the, the first time they, they get stuck at night, so they sleep in the swamp. And while well, I've been there, it's in daytime, it's horrible. But I can't imagine having to sleep there at night. I mean, oh, man, over the mud and the stink and the leeches. And oh. so they, they sleep in that 
horrid environment and the next day they they continue and then they have a, a more or less a lucky break as they see the um, uh, the balloon of the emergency radio uh, the, the radio itself was damaged but the um, uh, the gibson girl uh, radio that's in a dinghy has a, a, a let's say a tethered balloon to uh, lift the antenna and the crew has uh, let the balloon fly so they can see it from about 100 meters away and then they notice the balloon and uh, Gillespie fires his uh, his rifle three times in the air and uh, Harold Tentagwijin hears the shots and also fires his uh, his service pistol. And then, well, I, I think it, it, it then takes maybe even an hour before they get to the to the plane. But finally, in in the afternoon, uh, they uh, they get there, and well, the crew is is so very very happy. Uh, they're falling in each other's arms. They, they'd love to drink some whiskey, but as the expedition was was a dry expedition, and I heard from uh, Gillespie's daughter that her father, well, he, he was Scottish. He, he liked a wee dram of scotch, uh, but he had to do with tea. <laughs> they had a tea kettle with him, and they uh, they brewed some tea. And then um, uh, at the end of the afternoon, the the rescue team took the crew to uh, back to uh, a native hut to stay the night and then the next day to the uh, to the small river so they could sail down in the canoes to uh, Kampung Baru. It's amazing that the, 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 you know, the crew are essentially all fit and well within parameters, aren't they? So they're, they're not as if uh, they've managed to survive their ordeal quite well. Yeah. That way. Well, one of the crew was, was uh, seriously injured when he was thrown from the plane. He, he cut his leg very deep on the, the, the sharp edges of the fuselage that was broken. The others uh, sew him up uh, and, and uh, threw in some um, antiseptic uh, stuff. Uh, but they were even discussing, uh, if necessary, cutting off the leg. Tantaquidgeon had a huge... Indian Bowie knife, uh, and they were looking at that knife. Hmm, does he dare to to amputate the leg? Uh, and they didn't dare to tell uh, the um, uh, it was the radio operator Pete Whipland. They didn't tell to tear him, uh, dare to tell him. Only years, years after the war, they uh, the Tentaquidgeon told him that he was, a, if necessary, about to uh, to cut off his leg. <laughs> I wonder once a crew's been through an ordeal like that, did they did they fly again? Yeah, 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 yeah. They, they at first, of course, they were sent off to uh, to some R and R in Australia, uh, and they had a wonderful time in in Sydney uh, of it. And then um, uh, early '44, they 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 flew uh, their required number of combat missions in, uh, I think, starting again in Morotai and then in the Philippines, and then in I think all of them, let's say, in spring. Early summer '45, they had the uh, required number of hours flown and were sent back to the to the states. You, you, you're not sure you really want to go back in a plane after that's but you know, after having to go through go through something like that. But I, I guess it could have been a lot a lot worse for them. I imagine the relief the relief of being picked up on the first day and having the regular oh, contact. Oh, sure, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that it really helped, uh, especially that first note that was dropped by their squadron mates. Yeah, and it has some remarks on it from Ira. Um, uh, if you're happy, wiggle your your little bottom <laughs> to us. And uh, we've confiscated your shoes and all stuff like that to make them laugh, I, I think. But what you read from their report is that later boredom sets in. They can't leave the plane because the plane is landed in a swamp. And the first supply drop was uh, some 100 meters from the plane. And it took them three hours to get to that drop and back. So they, they didn't leave the plane. So they were on that plane for almost three weeks, uh, just sitting there, totally bored uh, until th- their their squadron mates dropped some books and magazines uh, for them. Yeah, just sitting there and, and trying to catch some frogs from for some extra dinner, uh, frog leg uh, dinner. But that's about it. They really bored out of their wits but well, it is a, a remarkable a remarkable story thank you thank you for telling it loyal listener if you want to read the full story Baz's book is case the true story of a daring rescue of a bomber crew from the swamps of new guinea as ever i will put a link on the website www2podcast.com for patrons of the podcast 
keep an eye out for more of Baz and I chatting about his experiences in New Guinea tracking down crashed World War II aircraft. It's fascinating. Not a patron and want to hear about Baz's experiences? Head to patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Well, that's all from me. For now, I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.